Good afternoon. Today we are having a conversation with Avi Armoza, one of the leading film and TV producers in Israel. He's the pioneer of the Israeli formats industry internationally, and he's the CEO of Armoza Formats. Mr. Armoza has been working in the industry for more than 20 years, and he has great expertise and experience in the television and film businesses. So we're looking forward to learning about his insights and views on the industry today. It's a big honor for us to welcome Mr. Amorza today. It's my personal dream to talk to you since the last year. Unfortunately, we failed to do this interview last year, <laughs> but luckily we managed to do it this year. Sometimes it's <laughs> better later than never. So I'm really glad to be able to talk to you uh, because uh, recently, we had a conversation uh, with some participants of the Russian market. And as you know, the TV shows formats, the non-scripted formats um, are not uh, that popular in Russia in terms that uh, we are not creating ourselves too many formats. Yeah, So we are really good uh, or we became really good at creating series recently, films. Uh, we are really good at creating local animations. But uh, in respect of uh, uh, local non-scripted formats, we're just on the way. And I don't know wh whether we will be uh, the country who is creating the non-scripted formats or we will stick to series. We can also elaborate on it later. So if you allow uh, me, I will start with a very simple but very traditional at this moment question. It's the question about that. How has film and TV content industry changed after the pandemic? What is your opinion? You know, the pandemic kind of uh, accelerates trends that we've seen before. Uh, and we, you know, we find the pandemic, find the, the TV market into a process, into a huge process of consolidation. Uh, and we can see that even in the last week or two weeks, you know, past the pandemic, this consolidation process is not, uh, is not ending. You know, Amazon is planning to buy MGM. Warner Brother, I think, is kind of uh, looking to merger with Discovery. So, so I think the pandemic, in a kind of a bit, slowed down the process of marketing, slowed down the process of creating new shows because when the the, the situation is unstable, you know, broadcasters are going uh, back to safety. And they try to put only show that they know and uh, show that we have a track record. So I think it's kind of a, a, you know, it's kind of holding back the, the industry, holding back the, the TV industry. Uh, the industry, the business of, of, of TV industry, the development of the TV industry is based on, uh, you know, on taking risk. And uh, taking risks is what uh, drives creativity forward. And uh, when we see that people are trying to go back to safety, I think it is affecting the, the international market. Uh, on top of what I said is uh, consolidation, that consolidation also um, uh, reducing the level of competition. And when you reduce the level of competition, it's also something that affecting the, crea the creativity market and also uh, when uh, the consolidation process uh, is uh, focusing on company creating their own IP. And when they focus on creating their own IP, they're not so open to get, uh, you know, good or great ideas that coming from everywhere. So uh, all in all, I think, you know, that uh, the market uh, at this stage is in a tough uh, position uh, and hopefully uh, past the pandemic and when the market will start to to open up, you know, the the physical market will start to open up and conferences, uh, it will give a kind of a new life and a new spirit into the industry. It's interesting what you are saying about the consolidation uh, on the global markets because in Russia, uh, we have a completely different trend, as you might know. Uh, there are around 20 uh, VOD platforms uh, which have recently emerged. They are in the toughest competition ever with media holdings, which are existing on the market for a long, long while. And actually, uh, in the local industry, they create and boost uh, more talent and give uh, really a lot of growth. And I think uh, they invest a lot into the uh, growth of new content, talents, and so on and so far. So somehow, strangely, we go in the other completely different direction as the whole uh, basically world in this uh, 
way. And you know, uh, talking about Israel, uh, for me, when I uh, entered the job and started uh, uh, working at Roskino and within the industry, definitely I was looking at some other markets where you can get inspiration and where you can think, okay, this is exactly the market where you'd like to learn. And for me, Israel is definitely one of those markets, yeah, as well as Korea is definitely very inspiring. And uh, those markets are inspiring because they first uh, create uh, extremely um, interesting content, not for only themselves, uh, but also distribute it uh, perfectly. And when you now looking at some other markets, basically, which countries are you personally most excited about? Not only uh, for their sales market potential and opportunities, but also for their new ideas and new insights. And where do you think, uh, or where do you find the inspiration uh, now? Are there any special countries or markets which you are looking at? You know, the world is a bit like of, of roller coasters and, uh, you know, sometimes one market is up and the other one is, is down. Um, I, I think I would first would like to relate to what you said about the, you know, the, the number of platform and the level of competition within Russia. And I think this is a, like a key factor that can drive the, the, the industry forward. The, the local industry forward and and, and therefore once uh, and 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 if you are successful in your local industry if there is a lot of platform and then a, a competition on creativity this will of course will drive the russian market i think also into the international market uh, you know there are countries like you mentioned korea and korea uh, it was a, a very strong effort that was supported also by the government which uh, kind of put a lot of money into is supporting the local industry to export a product. And because, uh, you know, in television, you always look for something unique, something fresh. And sometimes when you watch into television, you say, okay, we've seen it all. What, what, what new can we bring, right? And this is why I think like new angle that came from uh, the Far East uh, was uh, uh, the kind of trend that you can see more on worldwide television and, uh, and people are now m looking more uh, into the Far East into, in terms of content. But I think, you know, it's a kind of trend that, uh, you know, you give it six months and it will change and then there will be another uh, territory that will stand out from the crowd and uh, uh, will be able to present their country. And hopefully it will be Russia so through, you know, the efforts and the, the work that, that you are doing as well. Thank you. It's interesting. We are not mm -hmm. looking that direction. <laughs> We're still looking at Israel and Korea. <laughs> and, you know, talking about uh, uh, platforms and uh, channels, some time ago, actually, you mentioned that TV channels are afraid of taking a risk and bringing new formats uh, to the prime time. Uh, definitely platforms, both international as well as local, they take a lot of risks and they don't afraid. They are actually striving for anything new uh, and they are ready to risk um, and how do you personally uh, with the appearance of the platforms see the situation and do the platforms influence the creation of non-scripted formats we see there is a lot of influence in series and how about non-scripted you know the the initial belief was that there is a content that is really directed into the platform and there is a different content that will be directed into the linear te television channels. But what we've seen is that um, uh, at the end of the day, also the platform are looking for television-like content. You know, I, I, I stake, you know, our profile of, of content. Uh, and, and I've seen like the kind of the different direction. What's happening is now that major television, all the networks are kind of looking uh, onto the philosophy and way of works of the platform and the shows that they are looking into are shows that uh, can be both successful in linear and on, on, on platform. So I think both worlds, the linear and the platform coming together. And at the end of the day, you know, it's a, a I think it's a positive uh, influence from, crea from creative point of view. The platform have a positive uh, influence on the market. Of course, uh, from commercial point of view, 
uh, the effect is differently because you know once you make a deal with the international platform it's it's a one deal you know the business it, as we knew it before that you have a strong IP and you try to monetize it over multiply uh, territory this is a uh, getting more and more limited and then uh, uh, but this is you know this is the world of television and uh, our job is to both learn how to work and to work uh, with any with any platform that uh, that is out there and uh, you know to direct our uh, to be able to create content to to any buyers uh, and I think you know it's a new reality but it's a reality that we need to adapt to and do you personally work with big international platforms? And if yes, how is it different from working with traditional linear channels or media holdings for you? Um, I think, you know, what we find out from experience first, that the deal making is, is uh, much longer to take, you know, it's a, it's usually, it's a long process of uh, signing a deal and it take like, you know, six to 12 months just to, to have a deal in place when they already said that they, they like the, you know, they like the format and they would, they would like to move forward. So I think the deal, the deal for making is a, is a bit a long, is a longer life cycle, life cycle that, that we know, that we know with others. And, and the other thing is that, um, with the global, since the global, some of the global networks, you know, are starting to open local offices in uh, in different territories, and uh, they are also you know they're looking for something that will you know it can be uh, successful in Japan or successful in Brazil uh, or success, successful in Scandinavia. But when even when they're making like a deal for 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 Brazil, still the policy of the platform that they will take global right, with the hope that if it will be successful. In one territory, um, it, uh, they will be able to make remix in other territories and other languages. Uh, so I think that um, uh, it's a much, it's become much more of a global business. And uh, the hope of format creators or, you know, like us, it is that if you have a successful idea, if you have a successful show, uh, your the ability is, you know, is you won't get as much, you know, format fee, but you maybe you will be able to produce it in other territories if the format is successful, which I think give an advantage to international uh, production group, give them an advantage to work with the with the with the platform because they they have the infrastructure of production in many territories and they have the abilities, you know, to make profit on productions and not just on the one-time uh, format sales that you usually do with, with a platform. So you estimate it more as a positive trend for your company personally? Or it's... <laughs> I, you know, I don't think it's... Uh, it's you cannot m anymore relate it into a positive and a negative. You know, you, you're saying this is the reality and the world of television is changing and uh, the, I think the company, if you want to be in the game for, you know, for the long run, uh, you need to adapt and you need to move, you know, with the industry. Uh, and it's not anymore the old game. There's a new game and you need to play it. Uh, that's true. <laughs> and it will never change again. Uh, and if we talk about series, because you are also not involved, not only in TV, uh, a non scripted format, but also serious. Five years ago, and time is flying, uh, basically you uh, said that ser series started getting popular. And around the time you've expressed your concerns that TV series might not have a stable long term future uh, ahead of them. And uh, that basically shows might see a comeback in a while. And five years have passed now, and we, we've uh, only witnessed TV shows uh, becoming more and more trendy, definitely thanks to the VOD platforms. But what do you think about the global viewer? Uh, what is the, um, do you think an average viewer has changed as well? And uh, what is the reason behind such a rapid growth of TV series audience? You know, I think that the uh, drama series, you know, are more 
more kind of open, you know, more, giving more possibilities, you know, for binge viewing. Because if you're hooked to a story, you don't need now to wait for linear television and watch it week after week. Uh, the idea of uh, the possibilities of binge has become very popular, binge, binge viewing has become very popular in the last few years. And I think the, the parallel strengths and existence of social networking, the fact that any, any viewers, uh, when he watch something that is successful, immediately give it a post. So the ability of marketing and pushing forward TV series and TV, you know, and, and drama and stories and, uh, you know, through social networking, I think this is what uh, those two trends kind of pushed the, the, the scripted industry uh, forward. Uh, and... Um, this is, you know, as I said, this is part of the changing world of television that uh, uh, because at the past, what you've seen is that in linear television is that uh, it was kind of trend, you know, some years there was uh, uh, the drama series were on, you know, very high and very much on demand. And then when come big shows like uh, uh, Big Brother or Survivors or The Amazing Race, you know, or Idol, all of a sudden, they kind of pushed, pushed the scripted shows aside, and everybody was looking, you know, like for reality heroes. The you know the reality heroes pushed on the side, you know, the scripted show. But then come the the platform and become successful. And as I said, with the push of social networking, they are now they are still dominant. So I think if I need to look now into the future, I think both will. Uh, scripted and unscripted will, will uh, go parallel and there is a, a room and place uh, for both of them oh, and, and you, you can see that the, even though the platform started uh, just with scripted now uh, all of them are trying to look what will be their identity on non-scripted as well you know what what is their family show what is their game show uh, and this is uh, this, those questions are still open because um, I think the creative television industry was not yet ability, you know, to understand and create the kind of show that uh, the kind of uh, non-scripted show that can be successful on, um, uh, you know, on international platform. Yes, that's that's true because I was uh, searching for some successful. Uh, uh shows and actually you cannot say there are any of them to be honest there, there are very few there are kind of unexpected but i think they are, they are still trying and there is no answer yet and what about storytelling because now we see that with the appearance of the platforms the storytelling is changing a lot also and with the appearance of the platforms we see it all changes and uh, with the appearance of the platforms the storytelling is changing and what do you think what defines the storytelling of the 21st century i think it's you can define it on the competition for the home page of the of the platform because uh, we as a viewers when we have such a huge variety of content you know coming from everywhere in different language and and uh, how can we pick up what we, what is our way of picking up the the next show that we would like to watch and in order for this to happen you know a show need to stand out of the you know out of the crowd in the show need to create a buzz it's, it's it tends to have a very unique angle of storytelling so uh, bringing to the screen more of the same, you know, it's not a solution anymore. It's not that we are looking for another crime series or another roman romantic series. We're looking for something that is different and unique, something that will attract our attention. And once we, you know, we watch the first episode, we need to be hooked and and follow the the season and follow the season, you know, forever. So it, it's a it's very challenging, you know, to the creative community and the producers, the kind of shows that, uh, uh, you know, that, that the viewers will be hooked from, from the first second and then will stay, you know, for, for one or two or three seasons. 
you know, you mentioned the unique storytelling and talking about unique storytelling, uh, where they basically um, were trying to do all the series interactive. And uh, what do you think? Uh, how important is it uh, for the young audience, this option of interactivity? And do you believe this is just a niche content or do you think it has a chance to become a trend? I think it's still a niche, uh, you know, a niche content because um, at the end of the day, whether you are young or whether you are old, when you watch television, the television is a kind of a layback type of watching. You know, you you want to come, you want to open your television, you want to see in there. Uh, and in, let's say, you know, we, we, we say how successful is the drama series. Why do we need to interact with a good storytelling? We want something, you know, that take us and we are really much, we are captured and we're going with the story. We feel we are, we are filled with that. By watching, we feel with, that we are part of it. We don't want to stop. We don't want now to stop the plot and, and interact with it and take it to this direction or the other direction. I think when you watch television, you don't want to work. Uh, you want just to, to enjoy and, and, you know, Either, either do something in parallel or, you know, look on the television. I think the interaction, maybe there is certain genres, you know, like games that, you know, there's still room for interactivity or, or something that's happening right here and right now. And you are, a, you know, you're taking part on, on a, you know, on a live event. There's some room of interaction. But I think in general, uh, it's a trend that will not hold. Uh, would this mean also that you are not a strong believer of the VR content? Um, although VR content also gives you a chance to lay back, uh, what do you think about the potential in this segment? I think you know. I think <laughs> that this is something that is a. It's still very. It's an early stage to anticipate, and also especially because uh, the technology is not yet uh, so user friendly. So I, I don't think that uh, there is still, you know, you cannot anticipate the future of this technology. I think once the, the technology is will be strong and in place and friendly and cost effective, then you will see if it's uh, bringing like an added value to the viewership of content. Uh, it's all about, uh, you you know, the... I don't, I don't, I think the, the technology is something that it's an enabler, it's something that enabling you uh, maybe to get a different experience, maybe to connect more strongly, but uh, uh, but at the, the end of the day, we are, as viewers, we connect to the face of the actors, we connect to the storytelling, we connect to the dialogue, and then the technology is only, if this is something that just is able to enhance it and to support it, then there is a room for it, uh, but and then uh, but I think the first stage is is that it will be accessible to quite wide population and will be you know user friendly, and uh, will be a positive experience. You know that you are able to watch more than fifteen minutes or twenty minutes. That it doesn't bring you an headache. That it's a uh, all kind of things that I think still uh, there are question mark about them. Yeah. That's an interesting perspective. So the, uh, those who are developing the technology should help us to make it uh, better in order to create the more exciting content for the viewers. <laughs> uh, regarding the, um, the idea selection and the selection process of the ideas, how do you create the ideas? And uh, are there any special techniques within the company, within the Armosa company, which you are using? Because I know the Russian producers, they sometimes make like, like the small hackathons or so on and so forth. Is there any technique or secret which uh, you are doing and using within your company? Uh, yes, but I can't tell. No, I'm, <laughs> but I'm kidding. I, think I was that, expecting uh, this answer. <laughs> No, no, but I, I think, you know, we need, the, you know, there is a philosophy of a company and the philosophy of the company and the philosophy, I think, of the business, that it, it is a business of not knowing, right? Nobody really know uh, how to create, you have the formula to create a hit. The thing is, is the element that you, 
the question, what are the ingredients that you have in the development process that eventually can bring you a success? You know, you need to be able to take a risk. You need to be open to ideas that can come from, from uh, everywhere. Uh, you need to look for things that you know, you need to look for new angles. You need to understand that um, the content is not just uh, in the hand, you know, of your own people or your own creative people. So opening up to the world, opening up to new ideas, experimenting, uh, taking risks, I think those are the elements that are important in, uh, in, 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 you know, in the process of development. And based on that, do you as a manager and a creator, which is very much open up to all the ideas, uh, are you able to select uh, and understand on the very, very early stage which projects uh, have very high potential and are going to become a hit and which are not? Is there any internal criteria or it's just a basical experience and you cannot understand it in advance? You know... In, in, in my background, we kind of tried everything, right? You can have a list of criteria and kind of tick them, tick them. And um, I, I think, you know, I do believe in gut feelings at the end of the day. Looking backward, you know, there are shows that have been successful and went through a very long process of, of checking, doing a proof of concept, going, doing a teaser, doing a test, producing a pilot, producing season, which is, uh, and, and then things can happen. Or the, there were projects that, you know, immediately from the first speech, you say, wow. You say, wow, and then when you, you, you have this feeling of wow, what we know that you need to, to move very, very fast forward. Uh, I think this is the beauty, for example, of the non-scripted shows, you know, because usually in a scripted show, the line, you know, the... the the cycle of production can be anywhere between three to ten years. You know, if you have a good story, in order to make it into a television series, it will be the soonest in three years. The, and, and you know, and you know, shows that took ten years for them to happen. Uh, I can give you, for example, our like successful music show, The Four, uh, which the first pitch on a PowerPoint, you know, that uh, was in the office was in November. Uh, by January. We, we, we shot a pilot. By March, we brought it to the international market. Uh, during MIP, the first deal actually was with Russia. Russia was the, the one who was movies moving forward. From MIPCOM, I went to the US, and in May, we had a, a deal with Fox Network. By October, uh, you know, the Russian version went on air. Uh, by December, we had the shooting. So, like, within, like, uh, eight to ten months, the show can be on the air and can be launched internationally. So, and this is a show that I'm saying, you know, okay, okay, the, the pitch was, uh, it was very clear that you're bringing a new storytelling, uh, you know, how to produce a music competition, you know, how to produce a talent show. You, you find a new way to tell the story of a talent show. And, and, and I think you, the strengths of company like us that we kind of combine creativity with marketing. So immediately when we see a creative idea, we need to understand what is the potential of marketing in international. Because if you don't have the, you, you know, you can have a very, if you don't have, you can have great shows. And I'm sure you look into the, the 20 different platform in Russia, you can find here then, a, you know, great show. But the question if you don't have the marketing platform to make the world known, known about them and to, to understand, to explain what's unique about them, it won't be helpful. So I think it's bringing the marketing skill and creative skill, you know, and, and, and bringing it to, to the world. Yes, and Armoz is very famous yeah. for that. And if we, we talk about marketing, maybe I'll just... Uh ask you a question about Russia also in Russian formats, uh, because uh, you have been working with Russian formats, not only selling it to the Russian market, but also uh, selling it to the world. And uh, what is your experience with Russian formats? How would you estimate it and evaluate? And what do you think about that, how it has been changing with the time? I think that... that um... I do feel that uh, Russia is still uh, on an early stage of penetrating into the international market. I think uh, 
uh, what I can see, you know, is like platform or event that you are doing or other event, there is a there is the will and energy to go to the international market, which I think it's a very important uh, first first uh, step. I, I think um, you know the ability of, um, especially in unscripted format, you need to to under, fully understand the global market, fully fully understand what can work. I think you need the you need the cooperation with your major network and major platform to bring uh, Russian creativity into into prime time uh, and to have like local success uh, and those local success can go internationally. So uh, uh, I think now you are in a stage that uh, you have the understanding and the capabilities and the will. I think to expand into international market, it's not an easy, you know, not an easy work. It's very competitive. You know, when you go into a MIP or MIPCOM, each of those markets, there is a, usually about 200 new formats that are launched during this market. So imagine out of these 200 uh, format, in order to have a deal uh, happen, you know, you need to really be unique, really be strong, really have the, uh, to be able to, you know, to make the, the communication, the publicity, the PR, to attend all the conferences, to, you know, to attend all the events. It's, it's, it's something that is not, uh, it's not enough, as I said, just to have a, a, a successful shows. You need to have a, a strong 360 uh, marketing campaign and and positioning and positioning uh, positioning Russia uh, as a strong creative market and and you know being uh, I was a uh, you know I had also the possibilities of coming and and giving uh, lectures and teaching you know some of the young creative community you know in Russia and I think the the there is the will. And I think there is the talent there. Uh, I think working with an uh, international uh, marketing platform like us, uh, attending the international market, I think uh, I can, you know, like the Korean did it or like, you know, countries like Israel did it, I'm sure that uh, uh, give it a year, two or three years with um, one successful uh, format can change a trend, you know, like... Uh, you know where was the the Dutch uh, creative community before Big Brother, right? You, usually, where was the the British uh, non-scripted business before? Who wants to be a millionaire? Sometimes it's a uh, one uh, successful format that can push the industry forward. That's interesting uh, because basically what you are saying is that the key success factor. Uh, for any industry and any show is first market intelligence and second marketing. So it's not even the story. It's not, well, I mean, story is kind of a conclusion of that. So first you get acquainted with the market and with the demands, then you do, and based on that, you build up a story and then you promote it in the best possible way. That's actually what you are saying. Because one of the questions which I wanted to ask is, uh, how did it happen that Israel became so successful? <laughs> but but you have basically answered the question. <laughs> no, but I'm saying I'm not saying that creativity and the storytelling are not essential. But you know, you, you know, having the the privilege to be you know the the first one that was taking Israeli content to international market, and uh, I think uh, what was the difference? Like we did. We did television and we did go show good shows before and we did after. I think uh, uh, if you don't have the marketing capability and the ability to do positioning and and it's not something that happening in one day, you know, it was a, it was a process, you know, it it took us uh, five to six years to position, you know, ourselves and to have some great shows. And then when we were successful, it kind of brought a lot of competition into the Israeli market as well. And competition is also something that pushed all the industry together. So I think if there will be like quite few compete, competing entities, you know, Russian entities that will push uh, in 
with or without cooperation with the international uh, platform. Um, uh, so, so creativity, but creativity without marketing capabilities, and uh, is is you know, it won't happen. It's interesting because uh, definitely uh, what is not that developed on the Russian market, but what has been improving uh, improving with the last two three years is marketing. It's marketing on every level, on the level of the production and distributors, as well as on the national level, because that's what we are doing now. So the promoting the country and its content, because there is a lot of potential, but definitely without promotion, you cannot reach your audience in order to inform them that this exists. And uh, talking about another thing, you know, I think in this case, uh, both Russia and Israel are pretty efficient in doing projects, uh, big projects for small bu budgets with very limited budgets, actually. And uh, to share your experience, how do you achieve that? And what can you share on this? Any advice, any recommendation? Do you think it's really important? And anything on cost efficiency, I would say and success on the global market. You know, with Israel, cost efficiency was a, a necessity. You know, you have a small market, limited budget, uh, but still, uh, you know, as a producer, as a broadcasters, uh, our viewers are uh, kind of used to high production value, right? They, they look into the US, they look into American series or British series. So they, even though they, they will not accept you uh, doing, you know, like uh, low quality of shows or poor production value just because you don't have a budget, you need to compete. And, uh, and the need, you know, you, the need to compete is to be more creative and finding creative solution into, into you know, being, being cost effective. Uh, this solution sometimes can come um, with technology, you know, the last thing, the, our last development in the field of game show is a show called Family Piggy Bank, where there is a, you, you know, when you sell a format, there is like a creative patent, but sometimes it can come along with a, a, with a technology patent. And what we did is uh, we created a show that um, we create all the staging, all the background on a CGI. So when we sell the format, the, you know, to a customer anywhere in the world, uh, they don't need now to ask us how expensive is the set because they have like limited capability of building huge studio new set. We, you know, with the format, we sell them also on a link or if you want on a discount key, we sell them the, the, the stage as well, all the background and the staging. And, and, and this is something that uh, like it's bringing like a new way of, of producing, uh, you know, cost-effective uh, shows. Or you can find a solution you know, as a producer, I was involved at the beginning of producing the, I don't remember the, uh, the show in treatment, uh, which uh, was uh, uh, basically two people sitting in a room and speaking, right? This is what a psychology, psychological treatment is. You, you don't need more than two people. And, and this is focus, you know, getting into the heart of storytelling. You know, it, you focus on the story, you focus on the characters, and if the characters and the story is strong, you don't need, you know, police car racing uh, each other on a highway. It, people can still connect it. So it was a, a, a creative way of producing a drama in, in, in a cost-effective uh, cost, cost way, uh, but still uh, giving a high level or high production value. So... Uh, yes, when you create, you do need to take into account all kind of, uh, you know, production uh, limitation and production capabilities. And if you can bring both a uh, high level of storytelling and and good production value, this is a thing where, where you are successful. You know, actually, I wanted uh, to uh, to finish with this question. But now it's a good time to ask this question because, uh, you know, recently, well, like what recently, one and a half years ago, I actually was talking to um, the Israeli fund and that's exactly what they said, that there is a very limited budget in respect of production. Uh, that's why there is a very high level of storytelling and out of 100 uh, projects uh, in the film fund, they must select five. So the competition is very high in the very beginning. In Russia, we have a different uh, type of uh, 
funding the projects, I would say. Um, we really do a very high uh, quality production and post-production, and there are funds to invest. And sometimes we uh, are not very much focusing on the storytelling. And actually, I'm a big promoter of Russian-Israeli cooperation. And I don't know whether you know or not, uh, this year we hope to have a uh, Russian-Israeli co-production agreement to be signed. It has been in process for ages, but hopefully it will be signed this year. And uh, I see that it's actually a very good match for the global market. Uh, Israel with its uh, unique and exciting storytelling and Russia with its high quality uh, production and post-production uh, could maybe together come on a new level on the global market as well. And what do you think about this type of cooperation and uh, potential? And how do you think well, production in general is important for the global expansion? Is it important or not at all? You, you know, like many, many things, you know, they can be uh, points, you know, for or, or, or against, you know, because if from a creative perspective, if I'm a creator, I will say, I would, uh, you know, I don't want any partners. I want to have my own money and I, have to, I want to have the full budget to do the show exactly as I envision it. But this is not the reality of life. You know, the reality of life, there is more and more limited uh, amount of, you know, of budget to produce. Budget are always reducing. And, and, and I think from creative perspective, if you want to achieve the level of production, you do need to cooperate. And you, need, you do need to co-produce. But what I find out is from experience that it, it, it is a language that people need to, to know. You know, you need to compromise. You need to understand it's not just, okay, let's do co-production. What does it mean? What are the partners uh, bringing, uh, uh, you know, to the table? And how do they split the work? I think the, the, the co-production treaty agreement is, is important. And I think it's a good step forward, you know, for cooperation, uh, uh, you know, between the countries. I think also, uh, and, and we are... You know, we are open for co-production. Uh, you mentioned Korea, you know, we do have a, a, a development, you know, with uh, with Korea. We did a co-development. We do have a, a co-development, you know, that was uh, presented in the last, uh, uh, you know, TV market uh, that was before before COVID, you know, with Onan TV in China, you know, the, the leading commercial uh, channel in, in China. Uh, I think trying to bring... When I describe the business of not knowing, I think trying to bring knowledge from different angles, uh, and this is this may be enabling you to bring unique ideas. I think I think it's important. So, I think if the Russian market is opening for co-development, co-production, it's a good step uh, forward to push the you know to push the industry into the international market. Yeah, the, the country has several co-productions, but I think it's a really big step forward in respect of cooperation, specifically with Israel. And actually, the whole industry is waiting for that. So let's wait for some positive results in a couple of years from now. Uh, you've just mentioned the uh, strong control uh, while uh, creating a project. And to be honest, I am personally a strong believer of the fact that no idea can be implemented without a strong control of the one who actually developed the idea. And you personally uh, served as an executive producer on, uh, on several of um, uh, Armoza's famous uh, shows, including Primetime Entertainment Show I Can Do It or The Four and many others. And here will be the question more for the managers of the company and media managers. How do you see if there are any correlation between the formats where you deep dive yourself and take your own control and those who you basically uh, have, or those who have their own way. And is there any criteria for the projects which you choose for your own ex um, executive control or not? And where do you personally spend most of your time now with having this huge experience and been so uh, efficient and successful both locally and globally? You know, one of the unique uh, element of the success of our company was that uh, the fact that uh, when we developed the show, it shows that we kind of put our own budget into it. We didn't go to in any partners because uh, 
usually we didn't operate as a traditional production company when you have a good idea and then you go and pitch it to the station and then you start a dialogue with the station and say take it to this direction take it this direction and sometimes you can get lots of the way so our philosophy was if we do if we have a great idea and we believe into it we are making it distribution ready you know we go in and invest and produce a full pilot and we do it accordingly to our creative vision uh, and only then we take it to the international market. Now, when you're taking it to the international market, you need to have the, the emotional and practical capability to let it go, to understand that now you gave, you, you took your baby and gave it to someone else to, you know, to nature and uh, to make it grow. And, and, you know, with experience, some countries are very much have uh, the respect to the format uh, and you know they follow the rules and some countries you know they will put a lot of effort to see how to change it uh, and it's always like a creative uh, a struggle and creative dialogue um, and um, I think it is important you know for when you sell a format it is important to the other territories to understand uh, you know you bought a format for what it is what is the you know what's the logic now and trying to see how uh, how can we change it but you know there is a need for like sometimes it's cultural adaptation sometimes uh, you mentioned the show i can do that so and i can do that on nbc we did it like a, a 60 minutes show 60 minute show it's like 45 minutes something like this you know when in italy when you go you sell a show we sold it to to rye it was a uh, they needed a show that was three hours long. So you take the same format and you need to have the ability how to make it shorter with a very fast pace or longer because this is the, this is the culture. This is the way. Uh, so you need to be able to, to be flexible and to find creative solution to adapt it to the need of the buyers, but still uh, be very firm of understanding what are the key characteristic of the format that with them you don't want to change with them you don't want to change you know it cannot be something totally different but you need to have to be, have the flexibility to some uh, a local adaptation so how would you estimate your influence on the local adaptation from 1 to 10 so it's one that you don't influence it at all or it's 10 that you completely influence it Average on an average on an average, I would say it's probably six. Uh, there are some territories, uh, you know, like uh, when I go, especially like uh, territories that are not nearby, or like if you go, if I went to the Philippines or I went to Peru, uh, they they kind of territories that show a lot of respect to to your knowledge and creativity and then will and will be very open to listen to our uh, advice uh, some territories uh, as i said within their culture they will try to say okay this is a great idea now what can we change so it's it's uh, I, I would say it's limited this is why i said it's six but we will push for to to be seven or eight Oh, it's just also, you know, a kind of advice for those who are selling formats that uh, they should not uh, lose the control uh, over that what they have created. <laughs> I, I think it's a very uh, correct approach, to be honest. And coming back to Russia, uh, you have known Russia for a very long time and much longer than many other foreign managers and producers. And has your perception of the Russian industry ever changed uh, for the years uh, of collaboration with Russia and Russian partners and Russian industry. And what trends have you observed uh, in the recent years? And what do you find like the most curious or interesting? Oh, micro, please. Yeah, I think that uh, the, the, the most, uh, you know, noticed uh, change was the, the jump that you did within the scripted world. Uh, uh, you know, I think the, the high production value, the low value, the, the value, you know, the, the storytelling, you know, and, and the will and the energy and the focus to go into the international market. I think this is something that was not exist. And I think this was the most dramatic uh, change that I could have seen, you know, within the Russian market. 
And what do you think does Russia, uh, need, what, what does Russia need to do uh, in order to become the next Israel when it comes to enjoying an international success with its scripted and non-scripted formats? Any special advice for producers and uh, distributors? Except market intelligence and promotion. I think you do need the, you need to have a dialogue and the support also of the, of the TV channels. I think TV channels need to understand that they, if they want to push, I mean, your own local channels, if they want to push the Russian industry uh, forward, they need to take risks. They need to be uh, open, you know, for, for local creations. Uh, you know, this is one side of the, the coin and the other side of the coin uh, is to aggressively uh, go to the international market for uh, invest in marketing, understanding you know uh, the rules of the game of being part of the international market, and and strive you know to to the one successful uh, format that will change uh, will change it all because you need to, you know at the end of the day it's a business of uh, one big success you know if you have the one uh, successful show I think it will. It, the one successful show can move the whole industry forward. But you never know what is this next successful because you can be very successful locally and completely not successful uh, globally, as well as vice versa, which happened also to your first show. Yeah, it didn't become famous uh, uh, within the Israel, but became extremely famous and made you very famous globally. So it's kind of, as you said, a matter of not knowing. <laughs> And Correct. may I ask Correct. you, because it's already my personal question, when you're saying uh, market intelligence, what exactly do you mean? Because I have my own understanding of market intelligence and being a marketing marketer by background, but I'm curious about that. What do you invest into those words? What do you really mean while saying this? You know, when we as a distribution company now, not just as a creative company, we look into the world of television, it's our job of each of our sales agent and of us as a company is to understand each uh, of the local uh, market. We need to understand what are the shows that are now leading the way, uh, what are the shows that are missing. You know, I can give you the example when, uh, when we came out with the four, and went to the U.S. market. Of course, we did went to everyone, but we did knew that the one company that is in need is Fox because Fox just gave up. You know, the year before they gave up Idol, they were looking for the next generation of their music show. So, I think understanding thoroughly understanding the the market, uh, understanding the channels, what they need, or the kind of show that is working. Because the markets usually follow trends, and if there is a show that's successful in one channel, you know that you need to come with a solution to the other channel. So uh, I think that the key element of being a successful distribution company is that you have the, the resource and the people that understand deeply the, the need of each territory and the need of each broadcaster. Does this mean you have local offices and local people, or you manage it all solely from the Israel? We, we do both. We manage a lot of it from Israel, and, and, and sometimes when we feel the need, we have also a local agent in key territories. Okay. Thank you. I think those were my main questions. Is there something which you feel we need to discuss or some topic which we haven't touched upon and is relevant or you would like to elaborate on it? No, I just want to hope that the next time we'll do it, we'll do it in in person and hopefully in Moscow. Oh, I hope so. Let's hope next year we can meet in person. It was a great pleasure to meet you, even online. It's good enough for now. <laughs> it's pretty optimistic in these weird times. And I really hope to see you in person soon, maybe in Cairns. Nice meeting you. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, much for, for your me. time.